I just want to thank, of course, the speakers who um, have uh, agreed to share their experiences, and especially Christine and Yvette for really leading um, this webinar and pushing us forward. Um, and thanks everyone for um, uh, registering and and um, joining us here today um, for those on Zoom and YouTube. Please share your uh, questions on, on the chat in both YouTube and Zoom. We'll be monitoring both of them. Um, and yeah, I just wanna say, we decided to make this a meeting because we want it to be a more dynamic discussion at the end. So I hope when we move from the, um, uh, the talks to the discussion, people don't disappear. That's what usually happens, right? Uh, so I hope that doesn't happen today because we really, really want to, to hear from you. This is not just you learning from, from our speakers, but us learning from, from your experience as well, which I'm sure um, all of you have something to share. So we'll start with presentations and then we'll have um, a Q&A after that. Um, and then we'll we'll have breakout rooms to to hear your thoughts on um, the singularities of doing conservation planning for plants um, and opportunities and and challenges as well. So with that, I'll pass to Yvette, our first speaker. Um, and I guess Yvette, you're it's better that you do, you introduce yourself than I do. Uh, so yeah. I'll share the floor to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Cassie. And let me just share my screen. Does that all look okay? Yes. Perfect. perfect. Great. So yeah, I'm Beth Harvey Brown and I work at the Botanic Gardens Conservation International. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today um, to talk about how we at PGCI um, are working with our partners to use conservation assessments produced through the Global Tree Assessment to scale up action for trees. Um, so just, I'm sure many of you will already have heard of it, but just in case you haven't, um, the Global Tree Assessment is a new approach to assessing the conservation status of tree species. It's co-led by BGCI and the IUCN SSB Global Tree Specialist Group. And our target is to have a conservation assessment in place for all of the world's tree species. So yeah, quite quite a big task for this, for this initiative. So how did we start off the process? So the first step, um, is that we had to develop the world's first list of tree species and also their country level distributions. If we didn't know um, how many species there were and what they were, we weren't going to be able to assess them. So this actually was a really big job just in itself. And we compiled data from various different databases, scientific references, and consulted with a, a lot of tree experts. And this information is now all accessible in the database uh, Global Tree Search. And it tells us that there's almost 60,000 tree species. So with nearly 60,000 tree species, this makes the global tree assessment the largest biodiversity assessment ever undertaken at the species level. So yeah, we've really had our work cut out over the last couple of years. Um, but last year, we managed to produce our landmark publication, The State of the World's Trees, um, which is a summary of extinction risk information um, for the world's trees. And it gave information on tree diversity, threats, uses, and conservation action. And the headline statistic is that we now know that 30% of tree species are now threatened with extinction, and at least 142 tree species are recorded as extinct in the wild. And this means that there are more threatened tree species than there are total species of mammals and birds, um, which again really highlights why having these kind of specific conversations focused on plants is really important because our task is a really big one. Um, what we really wanted to do was make sure that all of this information that was used to compile the state of the world trees was available in a more accessible format. So we've developed the global tree portal where you can explore global tree species distributions, their conservation status and also conservation act actions. And this is available um, at three different levels, the species level, the country level and the global level. So for example, at the, uh, country level, you can type in a country and it will tell you which, uh, how many species are native to it, which ones are endemic and how many are threatened. And you can download a CSV file 
thought we'll have those species and flag up the endemics and also their IUCN red list um, status. And then additionally, at the species level, we also have a conservation action tracker, which uh, records current conservation action and who's doing what. So it's a really important tool to try and um, identify gaps in conservation effort and also to encourage collaboration between partners. And it kind of adds an additional layer of information to the red list because it's much more focused on recovery. So do we know if there's a propagation protocol? Uh, is it found in ex situ collections, all that kind of thing. So much more focused on kind of future recovery planning. So we're hoping that that will be a really useful tool um, for planning into the future. So the global tree assessment will be completed by the end of next year. Um, however, conservation assessments are only the first step towards the conservation of a threatened species. So once we've identified um, a species as being at risk of extinction, we need to plan actions, um, so we need to identify what those are and who needs to implement them. So we're really excited that as we've been completing assessments, often now we've kind of got national um, group countries now have completed a lot of their assessments. And we're excited to kind of move from that next phase of um, how do we use these conservation assessments to um, inform, plan and then have subsequent actions. Um, and also highlighted by the kind of scale of the problem with the State of the World's Trees Report, if we were to go species by species developing kind of single uh, species recovery plans, um, that would take a really long time. And probably by the time we'd have done that, but, you know, even a small subset of species, a lot of them will um, have become extinct. So we're really interested in trying to get that balance where we're making sure that actions are tailored as much as possible to specific species, but also um, being able to avoid duplication of effort and maximize impact by kind of finding approaches that coordinate um, a multi-species um, approach. And, and this is what we've been kind of looking at, at exploring uh, conservation planning at a national level. So we first looked into doing this in Kenya, um, which is a country that has um, a great variety of um, ecology and has two important global biodiversity hotspots, including the eastern Afro-Montane biodiversity hotspot and the coastal forest of eastern Africa. We have a real high diversity of tree species. Um, there are more than 1,000 uh, native trees to Kenya. And we're also really lucky that in eastern Africa, we have a very active Red List Authority, and they're a huge reserve of botanical knowledge, and they've been producing assessments for a really long time now. Um, so we were able to utilize that information and that resource uh, to run a joint Red List workshop with them in 2018 to assess the remaining endemic trees to Kenya. Um, and in addition to having really good botanical knowledge in Kenya, we also have very good uh, conservation partners on the ground, including botanic gardens, um, and there's also a huge national interest in tree planting, and they have a very large uh, bond challenge um, pledge. So the IUCN Species Survival Commission strategic plan promotes three activities to ensure that threatened species are conserved and managed sustainably, the Assess, Plan, Act. Um, so the, the first uh, being Assess, uh, where assessments are carried out by registered authorities and specialist groups. So, for example, in Kenya, this was with the Eastern African Plant Red List Authority and the Global Tree Specialist Group. And then moving through into plan, the Conservation Planning Specialist Group providing support um, to move through that cycle. So we reached out to the Conservation Planning Specialist Group really early on in the process. Um, and they were an invaluable source of um, support. And when we did our conservation planning workshops, they very much led the facilitation of that process and helped us develop the workshops in a way um, using their kind of guidelines, which they use, but also very much tailored to um, tailoring it to plants and that kind of multi-species method. So they were a, a real invaluable resource um, and we definitely wouldn't have been able to do this without them. So, but yeah, they were really kind of key players in this process. And then lastly, for the ACT um, element, these were our participants of our conservation planning workshops um, and there are a range of different stakeholders including research institutes, botanic gardens, uh, NGOs, uh, government, and also um, community-based organizations as well. So for our workshops, 
um, me and myself and my colleague Kirsty Shaw um, worked with our two um, conservation planning specialist group um, facilitators, which was Caroline Lees and Claudia Gibson, who are based in New Zealand. So there was a lot of very late nights for them. Um, and this was, yeah, back in 2020. So it was a, a really new experience. I think also for the conservation planning specialist group, they hadn't done much plant work before. So they were also very interested um, based on their experiences, mainly with working with non-plants to try and, you know, also kickstart their work in plants as well. So it was a very kind of exciting uh, project for both of us. Um, we used um, for the workshop, uh, their kind of planning process of looking at where are we now? Where do we want to get to? What are the obstacles? What do we need to do about them? And how are we going to do it? And the key things we wanted to get out of the workshop was kind of understanding uh, the threats to trees in Kenya, what actions can be implemented to address them, and what are their indicators of success, who are the key stakeholders, and then really getting into the nitty gritty of what are the next steps. So we make sure we've got that immediate timeline of, okay, when this workshop ends, what are we going to do about it? So in preparation for the workshop, we developed a timeline. Um, so there were five workshops over the two month period. We had a national opening workshop where we had um, stakeholders from all over the country. And then we had three workshops were very much focused on two priority regions. And then a final one that was national as well, where we kind of reported back and agreed the kind of next steps at a national level. Um, unfortunately, it was the end of 2020, so it was very much middle of COVID. So all of this was done um, online, which had challenges, but also opportunities. Um, the kind of good thing when you can be in person is you, everyone's kind of in the room in four days and there's a bit of a mission and you can, you know, get a lot done. Um, but virtually did, did have some opportunities because we were able to spread the meetings um, over that kind of longer period. And in between each of those meetings, we were able to do quite a lot of synthesizing about um, what we had done and I've got a lot of like um, future prep and be able to bring individuals from the working groups um, to do bits and pieces of work so actually before each of the next sessions we were actually we got quite a lot of dirt done and um, were able to make quite a lot of progress so it definitely did help to have that bit of time in between the sessions and also because it was virtual, you can't really expect people to sit there for days. So we kind of capped each session at three hours, which I think was a really good um, um, level. So for that kind of planning to plan, we did do a lot of planning to plan. Um, for each session, we did uh, made sure we had aims and outputs. So we knew exactly what we wanted to do. And again, to try and add variety, it's very difficult to be sat doing the same thing for three hours. So we made sure that we developed some specific online tools that would help us um, through this process. So we very much, again, working with CPSG, developed these kind of very uh, useful online tools to make sure that we could kind of get the most out of everyone um, during the workshops. So before each um, session, we developed um, a prompt sheet that was given to each of the facilitators um often the sessions will have quite complicated parts of them will split up into breakout groups someone will be sharing their screen someone needs to be keeping time some people will be presenting on different things so it was really important to have that kind of rundown of exactly who was responsible for what and what the timings were for each of those um particularly being online it's really important to have had that all worked out um and at the end caroline always put have an aspirin and lie down because doing a workshop online like this is really intense and I think as a facilitator you always want to make sure that you kind of uphold your end of the bargain because everyone's giving up their time to be there you want to make sure you're getting the most out of their knowledge and making sure that you you're kind of fulfilling the aims of the workshop so you know you really do want to kind of make sure you've done that prep beforehand so that you know you can really kind of juice all that knowledge out of everyone um in those hours that you have so another thing that I was kind of really leading on is um, also developing some assess to plan matrices. Um, so this is where uh, registered assessment information is exported. Um, and if you look on the left hand side, that's basically parts of the red, it's impossible to see, but there's basically different parts of the red list. So you have things like the distribution habitat, threats, um, and then on the bottom, it's the different um, different species. And it basically, enables you 
kind of to take a step back from the red list where you can see it all in one place and they're able to try and find groupings between species. So which species have similar threats, um, which species have um, similar habitats. Um, and it's that kind of helpful for when you're trying to like make groupings to say that this suite of um, species needs similar kind of actions. And this was really helpful. So what we ended up doing was um, to specific priority areas were selected for these workshops. So we focused on um, species in the coastal forest and also species in the tighter hills, which is part of the Afro-Montane um, hotspot. And we produced um, two matrices um, for each one of those areas. Um, and they were really important so that we had a list for all the species that were found in those areas, the key threats um, in each of those areas. So that was a really useful for resource because later on, in the workshop we had a threat analysis session and all of those threats were based on um, the red list data so again using the red list data directly to feed into the planning process and also all this all the mapping data was also all the maps from the red list as well so again really helping to show how that the system is all linked together um, and is you know not duplicating effort by trying to you know redo everything you're trying to use what information you have available we also did a stakeholder analysis to make sure we had representation, representation from key groups and um, develop briefing materials to make sure that everybody knew how we got to where we got to and um, had the same information available about where we wanted to go. So we had um, a series of workshops where we had over 30 different organisations represented. Um, in, in the first um, workshop, we did visioning sessions. This was getting our partners to um, look into the future for 10 years and let them say if the conservation plan is successfully implemented, looking back and what were those key things which meant that it was a success and to describe those changes. So we got them to do that on a Padlet board, which we then summarised and we had over 60 contributions and then distilled into a visioning statement which captured all of these different elements. Um, we then also developed five goals, national level goals, and um, a website which um, had all our collaborators' information of the process. And then we went down into our regional uh, groups where we did a threat analysis. So that's why I was saying here in the boxes in red are the red list threats and the numbers are the number of species. So the bigger boxes were ones which were affecting more species. And then we dug down into their causes, impacts, and obstacles. And then in the next two workshops, we very much got into solutions. So what are the, the key threats and how do we then mitigate them? Um, and then also looking into prioritizing those. So for example, for the tighter hills, looking into the threats and then also going into the conservation strategies to um, be able to um, effectively try and um, combat those threats. So then lastly, in the last workshop, we very much focused on the next steps of um, which of those regional actions should be elevated to the national level. We also did quite a nice thing where we got everyone to go to a Padlet board um, and then under each one of the goals, pledge what they were going to do. So we had kind of concrete actions with the organisation underneath saying we will do X, Y and Z to contribute to this goal. So that was really nice. And then lastly, after the workshop, we drafted a report, um, which everyone was able to input and edit. And this has been a really vital tool for um, helping us to develop stronger funding applications. And a number of these have been really successful. And I think that's just because it highlights how doing really good planning, getting all the partners involved at that process means that when you're going to do funding applications, they're going to be well thought out. They're going to, you know, they're going to be attractive. And then the partnerships that result from those funding applications are going to be a lot stronger than they would be otherwise. Um, so yeah, that's maybe, and I'm going to pass it to her that I'm not sure if he's speaking next or later, but he will go into more detail about what we've been doing um, since the planning work. So yeah, quite a nice full circle to show the whole process. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Yvette. Um... We had initially planned to Marcia to go next. I don't know if it makes sense to Herbert to follow up from your presentation maybe, since it was the same 
project. Um, I don't know if Herbert is ready to present now. Oh, uh, anyhow, anyway, I can now, I can after anyone uh, followed how she's done it. Thank you very much. Thank so you, do Herbert. I go or I wait after? Yeah, you can go now. Do you mind, Marcio? I go on. Yeah, go on, Herbert. OK, thank, thank you. you. So thank you, Yvette, for I'm sharing my screen. And uh, OK, let me do this a little bit faster. Sorry, so um, I will go from, uh, hello, is, is it visible? Not yet. Okay. Is it visible now? I can't see it yet, but I can see you sharing. Yeah, I can see it now. Thank you. Okay. So Yvette has done a nice introduction of how we formulated from the idea to the whole process looking for partnership. So me, I'll jump to where the rubber meets the road and uh, show you some little progress as at now and uh, how far we've gone. So welcome all. And um, uh, now this is where the action started. And uh, after the workshops and the sites um, were identified, then down to species, species level and then scaling up to improvement of existing initiatives and starting new, new ones, uh, using the maps and the various tools, we were able to do the various um, uh, surveys in various counties first it was to check whether all that we have and had been mapped as a pre previous historic um, data is still there. And then uh, that was the right thing to use, especially in uh, training and also to, to correct or also to add on to the data that's existing because surveys are uh, are uh, done and perhaps not everything is captured or what was captured previously might be missing. So we did the mapping of the target species. We collected voucher specimens in various uh, locations and uh, did uh, lots of phenological surveys. And uh, during all this time, we also were doing all these activities with um, the community and also the stakeholders so that they can learn from the field even as we go on to the seed collection, community training, and then the submission of sites for future planting. So uh, we were able to get some of the species um, and we are also unable to get some. So it's, it's uh, still work in progress. We are not sure if some of them have been, are, are extinct by now because some are not, uh, in their previous uh, locations as recorded historically. For example, these are critical species, cr critically endangered species in uh, the Shimba Hills, and it's uh, Vanguriopsis uh, shimbaensis. It's one of the trees that has the least population in the moist forest. Uh, these Sorry, are some Herbert. Of the... yep. I don't know if you're moving your slides. We're still looking at the first slide. I don't know if you're moving forward and we're not just seeing it. It seems like okay. I'm moving, but I'm not seeing it. No, and we're still looking at the um, yeah the actual PowerPoint, not the the presentation mode. Is it moving now? 
Yes, if you, you you're clicking, yeah, now we can see it, but it's not on presentation mode. It's just on the PowerPoint. Okay. How do I achieve that? No. Yeah, Punk Chab is saying for you to use the presentation mode on the lower right hand corner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're seeing with the notes, but that's fine. I think this is fine. Yeah, perfect. That's fine. Eh? So this yeah. is uh, the example that I had been talking about. And uh, that shows uh, the biggest parts of, uh, of the plant and what we are checking to see. So we would check on the flowers, show the flowers, to some of us, it was the first time we are seeing it, other than the descriptions given in the taxonomy books. And then also it involved lots of uh, um, analysis of the populations, uh, the sizes of the trees, uh, if there is any regeneration, if the trees are seeding, and that was very important. So these are some of the information also we collect to take back to the uh, East African herbarium. Um, so this is a, a herbarium vulture of uh, uh, Isolona cauliflora. So that's very, very important. Also to update the records that are there. Um, and uh, this is uh, exactly what happens during the phenological uh, uh, surveys and vulture specimen collections. So we, would also, we were also keen to take uh, uh, nice quality pictures that we'd use, especially as we go on, as we do any publication, and also to, to inform others about uh, the species so that they can go and see it, uh, even if it's a different officer working at a later time. And uh, it also followed, it was followed by some training uh, in various communities, these pictures from Shimba Hills. And uh, we also did some training in every other county that we did it. So. We did it with the Kaya communities and also with the Mount, with the, the counties around the Mount Kenya. And uh, this uh, shows that uh, even the training was uh, participatory. So um, she has um, touched on, uh, on uh, this slide and I will jump and show some of our um, some of uh, what we got so uh, so for the partnerships we did it uh, we, we did a partnership with the international tree foundation and uh, we were able to do the surveys and the trainings in uh, four counties around uh, mount kenya and uh, we can see the demographies and the data of uh, the people who participated in the trainings and the trainings were definitely to build capacity in the community of and forest associations on id of the trees, seed collection, pretreatment, propagation, and planting of the threatened tree species. This is a knowledge that will equip them, continue with the, with the activity at the field level. And uh, they, they, some of the partners like the ITF who deal with uh, much more than our scope, especially things to do with, uh, with the gender mainstreaming, in conservation, uh, river rehabilitation, agroforestry school projects in these counties also will help such that if we would achieve these uh, targets, we'll end up uh, incorporating the threatened tree species in the local community planting. So they definitely have a formal way of doing it and they are attached to some of the national uh, partners like Kenya Forestry, uh, K KFS service and also K3 and others. So the capacity building went on in various places. Uh, you can see uh, most of it was happening, not necessarily at a far location, but at their working location in their nurseries so that what we will touch, we will do some improvements on site. 
uh, we would also display all the materials that we get and even uh, try uh, carry others from different locations so that we can show them how to deal generally even with uh, the issue of uh, tree planting and also dealing with various kinds of seeds which are also not necessarily threatened but they are part of their activities so this was at uh, Samburu as you can see the mice are even displaying their cultures they're working and also uh, the, the, the right side was in Meru so we would also try uh, to teach them their species from their local dialect so that they can understand them it wouldn't be so important for them to know them in Latin if they don't know them in their local dialect, because that also will help us uh, in using their local knowledge to trace where these trees are and also to know if there is any activity going around them and maybe perhaps understanding uh, understanding uh, how they can, uh, they can achieve all that. So an example of um, thus far, that was the first, the, the la that was last year. This year, we have had um, our, our surveys and uh, follow-up follow surveys, and uh, we are noticing a lot. Definitely, at the moment, uh, Kenya seems to be very, very dry, and I think it's happening in the whole world that there's lots of climate change, and their effects are far-fetched here. But um, uh, subsequent surveys in Kiambu, we found out that there is new population, additional individuals, in the existing documented populations. For example, uh, if you look at bullet point B, that is Euphobia cosanoides, at first we only knew um, one individual in, the, in, in a single, in a, in a population, but uh, we got another new population with 12 individuals down the river, which is more than 20 kilometers on a follow-up surveys. Uh, and uh, that has enabled us to understand the, the distribution and we are yet also to do more and more surveys. So uh, this, is, this is a result of what we did from the first survey where, where we first um, uh, went and used the, the, hist the historic data and we got one tree. We didn't know there are two more others hidden in the bush like mature seedling trees and uh, we got a couple of seeds. Uh, the seeds were germinated in various locations, uh, one at Mantari Nursery, one in uh, Thika uh, at uh, our, our partner's nursery, and also one in National Museum. And all of them have got nice, good results. We are having more than 200 um, seedlings coming up. This is a plus for our critically uh, endangered uh, species and uh, we are yet to wait for them to mature and reach the size of the field planting so other than that some of them have been planted like uh, the green uh, big leaf uh, that is brucia macrocapa and also during our surveys some of the species which we never targeted we found them like um, uh, you can see there's paveta paveta the black fruits and also Bafia, which is endemic to Kenya. Um, so these are some of the data we've been collecting in terms of uh, how much seedlings we are coming up with. Some of them are far from the target numbers, but uh, we're still working on to see if we can, we can get to good numbers. So these are other sites and uh, also other sites uh, surprised us having uh, new recorded populations of some threatened species in Kenya, which were not previously recorded, like here the Brucia macrocapa, the Vitex keniensis in Embu, um, were, were not previously recorded in the same places. So that happens in uh, most of the locations. So this is data from Meru, for example, like uh, the forest has generally dried and we are having. We are seeing a lot of uh, degradation of some species like uh, Premna and uh, Uvariodendron and Satam being taken down by elephants. I think they're hungry because of um, the lack of uh, green vegetation currently. And uh, also, we, we are still following up and seeing some of the nurseries uh, still have needs, like some of them 
have lost their water sources and thus we end up losing seedlings. So those are some of the challenges we get in uh, some of the places. So here is a very hard to reach county, partly because it's semi-arid or, or almost arid in some parts. And then um, there is a lot of insecurity in the Northern Kenya. So this is a county that had their uh, four target species and among them we've only managed to reach uh, three sites with uh, a success of two, two uh, species. So the species are here and uh, some of the challenges also showing and you can use this to predict future populations like for the Okotea, um, we found that all the individuals were old and no signs of immigration sent to Primna Maxima. Uh, but on the Primna Maxima, much as there's, there's none germinating on the floor of the forest or maybe juveniles, there's a lot of seed lying on the ground. So on such, we were able to, to organize that in the future, the forest service will still go in the forest uh, with the communities so that they can do it in the nurseries and maybe preserve some plots to do uh, regeneration and uh, reforestation with the same species since most uh, individuals are old. So this is, uh, this has a base of like uh, six meters diameter and that's uh, the endemic camphor in Kenya, Okotia Kenyansis. And uh, that's a picture of a seed of Premna, Maxima, maybe 10 times zoomed in. So this is our team as uh, they are trying to identify and also show the community while inside the forest. This is a week ago in Masabit. So other than that, we also had the Kaya forests, which consists of uh, the coastal forests and uh, the national museums and the sites uh, protected by the national museums as cultural sites where they use to do their rituals and also to, to to, they are also used for any other, um, like a source of food and every other thing. So we were able to get some seeds in box, like boxes of, of Psifolia. No one has ever had that in their nursery. Nurseries of growing collection and sowing is happening. Also very lucky to get uh, Kofea, Sudizandrobaria and Rogalis Kenyansis. All of them have been seedlings at their nurseries. So these are the pictures. At Kaya, at the, at the various Kayas, this is Kaya Choni, and that's uh, Kaya Mze, like the elders uh, on the top left with the seedlings of Kofea, Sudozagwebariai, and then uh, down we have uh, the communities and the families being shown how to do the seeds. And luckily, 90% uh, of the seeds of uh, Dovialis Kenyansis do germinate. Uh, this is also some small nurseries at their homes since seems to be very far to transport water to their major nursery inside the Kaya at, uh, at Kaya Mtsokara. And uh, on the picture, that's a picture of boxes uh, that we were able to get seeding. So these are some of the nurseries and they're really doing a good work amid all the struggles that we are having. So that's... Um, a scope of what we are having and it's still continuing on and uh, we're trying to to look forward and uh, we're looking forward for the rains because we know without the rains we can we can hardly go far since nature won't reproduce and have seeds without it so thank you and i'll pass it back thank you herbert it's really good to to hear quite good examples as yours when things really, really work, right? Um, okay, so just to say everyone, um, if you're watching us on YouTube, please feel free to join us on Zoom. Kelly just shared the link um, on the YouTube chat. Uh, we had a hundred people registered from the plant um, uh, groups, but clearly, yeah, only a quarter joined us. So if you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to join us on Zoom because we'd like to have a, a discussion at the end and it will be great to, to have participation from different expertise. Um, and I'll pass to Marcio to share the experience that um, uh, Rio de Janeiro Botanic Garden and Sensei Flora have, have 
the work they've been doing on conservation planning in Brazil. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Katja and all organizers for the invitation. And wherever you are joining us, it is indeed a great uh, pleasure to be present to you today on a few steps on how we develop the plant uh, conservation planning in Brazil. And I will try to talk about challenges, opportunities, and one success story. Okay. Uh, so, following the species conservation cycle, uh, we use the standard tools to assess species, uh, species conservation status, to plan collaborative conservation strategies and policies, and then act to reverse the risk of plant uh, extinction. And uh, here in Brazil, our first uh, biggest challenges uh, was to catalog uh, flora species. And today we know that we have more than 37,000 species of native plants and 19,000 of which are endemic uh, species. And to date, more than 7,520 uh, forest species have been assessed. Uh, and of those, uh, 3,213 species are threatened uh, with extinction. These assessment numbers represent 21% uh, of all no flora species. Moreover, 43% uh, of them are threatened with extinction. Uh, with this number in mind, uh, how to plan conservation strategies for plants? This is the path we have taken to prepare the National Action Plan. And the first step is to define the scope and approach for the plan followed by data analysis, field work, definition of priority areas for actions, the conservation planning workshop, and finally, the consolidation and publication stage. In this step, uh, the conservation target uh, and the plan approach are defined. Uh, that is, uh, it will be focused on a single or a multi-species plan, for example. And here in Brazil, due to the large number of threatened plant species, we have preferentially adopted a territorial approach because it cover a great number of species, optimize efforts and research. Also, um, mobilize local stakeholders and strategic coordinator actions to address uh, threat in this area. In the data analysis step, uh, we use the species information from the species risk assessment and search from detailed data about the territory. Uh, the field work step cover three goals, uh, collect uh, biological data, for example, record the target species in the wild um, and mapping and on-site verification of threats that have been identified uh, in geospatial database. And finally, identify local stakeholders and existing conservation initiatives. Here, uh, tools are used to allow prioritization areas based on opportunities for conservation, avoid uh, conflicts with the economic activities and uh, arbitrary decisions on necessary actions. Uh, it also directs to the areas where conservation actions will be most uh, successful and cost uh, effective. With 
all this uh, information and data prepared, we have the workshop uh, with different uh, stakeholders to define the objectives and agree on actions, including associated uh, products, responsibilities, uh, deadlines, and costs. The last step is to prepare the publications, uh, which can be a book or uh, executive summary for this uh, dissemination of the plan. And all products for creating the administrative uh, process are consolidated in this uh, step. Then the plan is approved uh, as a conservation instrument uh, through an administrative ruling published in the official Gazette of Brazil, and the technical advisor group is created to monitor this uh, plan. This graph shows us an overview of the number of threatened species with national action plan over the years uh, in Brazil. Uh, as you can see, the, this territorial approach uh, of the plan uh, allowed, allowed us to, to scale up uh, the number of species, including in national action plan. Uh, our focus here is to ensure that we don't just include threatened species in national um, action plan, but uh, also mobilize so that strategic actions to uh, are effectively uh, implemented. Uh, these are the national action plan for plants that we coordinated and here and Favero Juizo national action plan was concluded. Uh, three other uh, action plans uh, are in progress and three are um, we are working on right now. Also, as part of national strategy for threat species conservation, uh, Brazil has been developing more than 10 territorial action plans that include uh, animals and plants together. And these uh, plans are coordinated by the state environmental agencies. Let's go uh, to the action. And in the implementation phase, the national action plans are monitored uh, each year by the technical advisor group. In the last year, the plan is uh, evaluated and can be closed or replaned or incorporated into another plan. Uh, this is the governance of the plan. The coordinator, uh, the coordination is carried out by Rio de Janeiro Botanical Garden here and monitoring by the members of the advisor group and implementation by all stakeholders. From now, I will show you uh, a case of Favero de Wilson National Action Plan. And well, uh, the panel uh, with the status of implementation of the 33 actions of the National Action Plan after the final uh, monitoring show, uh, showed uh, that 45% of them had been done and 27% had been uh, started and not completed in time. And another 27% uh, had not started or eaten. Among the results of the plan, I, I highlight here uh, for you just a few that I choose, uh, such the production of a wanted poster and leaflets. These three hunting uh, mobilized local communities and many people as the materials were fixed uh, everywhere. And then uh, people called uh, co-researchers when they found a tree uh, it is, uh, this uh, made it possible for researchers uh, to find uh, new trees and populations of species. Farmers uh, who protect the tree on their farm were awarded uh, a species protect uh, protection certificate. 
and one illustrated educational booklet preserving the rare favirus uh, intended to for school, farms, favirus hunters, stakeholders, and other partners was published. And four educational activities performed at schools, four events involved presentations, uh, exchange of ideas, and tributes to volunteers. And a great deal of research was carried out on Favero de Wilson in, in the following areas. For example, population ecology, prospecting and inventories, population genetics, reproductive biology, exit dispersion, phys uh, physiology, and seed conservation, and propagation in nurses, for example. And genetic studies, uh, for example, have shown that Favero de Wilson is probably a natural hybrid of another uh, species. More than 1,500 people from different sectors of society act as collaborators or beneficiaries of the plan teachers, students, farmers, uh, volunteers, and 20 institutions representing the society, NGOs, the private sector, uh, sector and government participated in the implementation of the actions. Uh, the three hunts uh, result in 44% 44, uh, 44, uh, in, uh, increase in the number of trees recorded and monitored. Um, and this represents an 8% uh, increase in the extent of uh, occurrence of species. And 414 seedlings were planted and monitored. With this knowledge product uh, with the plan, it was possible to reassess the species in a lower risk category. Uh, this is, uh, is still not a genuine uh, category change, but it was uh, greatly celebrated by all involved in the plan. Uh, the species also had the evaluation of the green uh, status carry out. Uh, which will allow us uh, to track progress toward full ecologically, ecological recovery, what is, uh, is still uh, challenging. Research uh, raised with public notice from uh, four sources. Uh, Although the final research obtained were quite uh, limited, uh, it was still possible to achieve a lot of and certainly obtain final, uh, financial research is the big, uh, biggest uh, challenge. And to finish, I try to summarize some challenges and opportunities or things that uh, have worked in conservation planning in Brazil. And for the topic and challenges, for example, financial research for plants conservation planning, growing number of flower species, a large number of plant species to assess, increased number of threat plant species, large uh, territory of the country, and action plan management, uh, it's a, a small teams, stakeholders and collaborators engagement and plant blindness. And for the topic about the opportunities and success, ongoing communication, messaging apps, for example, or newsletter, uh, and regular meeting with the plan advisor group, seminars for collaborators to share experience and territorial approach uh, to the national action plan, uh, state coordinated conservation planning and projects developed jointly uh, by the networks and appreciate the contribution of local people. And many thanks and please feel free to reach me uh, if you have any future questions. 
Thank you, Marcio. This is great. Um, quite a few good examples. I love the the um, uh, fi finding um, yeah program. I think it's it's great. Um, okay, and I'll pass to Christina um, from Colombia. She's actually going to have two hats. <laughs> one from uh, the National Plans in Colombia, but also with SICADS. On right. to you, Christina. Um, Capia, do you want to have uh, Eduardo first, since he's also from Brazil, and then me last, or? Eduardo isn't actually presenting. Oh, okay. He was, yeah, <laughs> supporting Marcio. I don't know, Eduardo, do you want to share something from the Brazil side? No. I think Eduardo was just supporting Marcio. Oh, there right. he is. Okay, so wait, can you see my presentation, right? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you for being here and for your interest in plant conservation and you know conservation planning in general. Uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to share some lessons learned from SICAT conservation at the global level and also at the national level. As you saw with the examples in Kenya and Brazil, doing the plan is actually, you know, quite challenging. And then implementing the plan is also quite challenging. And we have been doing that for SICATs for many years. So we want to share some of our experiences and hopefully, you know, this will it'll be useful if you are to start some conservation plans or you're already implementing conservation plans. And I'm going to talk from the point of view of SICATS. Um, at the global level, we have a SICAT specialist group. And well, it's very old, it's more than 30 years old. And we have done red list, global red list of all SICATS three times already, we have about almost 400 species of cycads in the world right now. So it's a relatively small group compared to trees or others, but you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of species that we do at the global level. And then we have had a conservation action plan at the global level since 2003. And now we kind of redesigned our conservation plan uh, in kind of a, bigger with more ambitious goals. Uh, and we actually call it the SICAT strategy 2020-2050. So we're moving into um, more concrete actions and you know, larger scales in several, in several um, topics uh, beyond the things we were doing before. And uh, as Katia was saying, I'm also part of the Colombian Plant Specialist Group, which is a very different type of a specialist group because it's focused on a, on a country or geographical region. And in this case, well, we're also doing a lot of red list assessments and we use that information for conservation planning at the spatial level. So we identify, for example, key biodiversity areas, uh, but we also do some conservation action plans. As uh, similar to the situation in Brazil, we have thousands of uh, threatened species and we cannot do detailed conservation action plans for all of them. So basically we try to do a lot of, um, well, to incorporate our threatened species into the protected area system or other effective uh, conservation measures based on areas so they can get protected in their habitats. But for a few strategic groups like palms and orchids, timbers and cycads, uh, we have conservation action plans. In this case, uh, we have been doing most of them for the last six, seven years. So this is a more recent experience, but it's an experience at the national level. So I want to combine those two experiences to share with you some lessons learned. And I want to do a disclaimer first. Uh, conservation planning and conservation action is, is complex and challenging, as you probably know. And I think most of us, uh, I speak for the specialist groups uh, from IUCN, most of us are experts from the natural sciences. You know, we come from biology or environmental sciences or resource management um, kinds of fields. Uh, but you will see that when you're doing conservation planning and action, 
you're going to need to go beyond biology and natural sciences, right? In many cases, the problems that our species are facing um, are caused because of economical and political and cultural factors. So we actually need to, you know, broaden our scope and we need to, the help of many other people, many other institutions in order to be successful in conservation. So I'm going to talk from the point of view of a person that is expert in the, an expert in the species, you know, an ecologist. We love our species. We want to save them from extinction. We want to preserve biodiversity. Um, but we need is is a very big challenge for us to get into this, you know, planning and action process. And well, I also want to say most of us are focusing on threatened species, but that's not the only uh, type of a species that we can prioritize for conservation planning. We can choose a species for conservation plants because of many other reasons. But anyway, I'm going to share lessons learned uh, from my perspective in cycles at the global and the, and the uh, local level. And anyway, sorry, I don't know what's happening with the coloring here, but anyway, the first lesson I want to share is that it's very important to emphasize the strategic part of a strategic planning. Uh, for example, um, actually think about what we call theories of change in some methodologies. There are many methodologies for conservation planning or project planning in general, logical framework and you know problem trees and stuff like that. This one I'm showing you here that we have used uh, for the national plants in Colombia is called the open standards. It was designed actually for, for conservation plans for, for um, protected areas, uh, but you can adjust them for, for planning for species conservation. And it's a very detailed methodology and it forces you to think not only about the threats for the species or group of a species, but also to actually try to identify the causes of the threats that again are usually you know, economic and, and, and legal or cultural in nature. Uh, so for doing this analysis, you actually need to collaborate with many other people and institutions. And I just wanna, I can talk to you about more this, if you wanna know about this methodology, but I just wanna emphasize that in this methodology, you choose conservation targets. In our case, could be populations from a species, or it could be species, or it could be groups of a species that we were uh, seeing for the Brazil example. Sometimes we have way too many species, but we can group them in, by region or, or by threat in the case of Yvette was showing us the access to plan approach. Anyway, you can group a species by, um, by any uh, criteria. And then you, choose, you define the threats, uh, which are here shown in, 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 in um, pink. And then you try to do what we call a conceptual model of situational analysis. And then you try to actually understand why you have the threats here, because it's not the same, for example, if you have habitat destruction because there's um, industrial agriculture uh, versus if you have habitat destruction because you have the small farmers are trying to you know, uh, get um, um, their surviving needs met, uh, the conservation strategies are gonna be very different uh, in those cases, even though if it's the same threat. So it's very important to understand all the causal links that are actually many of these causes can interact with each other and you know they can generate these threats for your species. And then you can build uh, in a methodology like this, what we call a theory of change. You actually propose conservation actions and then you say, okay, I'm gonna do this, and then in five years or 10 years, I'm gonna see these intermediate results, or I can get to these intermediate targets, and then I can reduce the threat, and then the status of my species or group of species is gonna improve, but you actually try to make that very conscious, and that will help a lot in planning the actions and then monitoring the actions so you can actually, um, um, learn from what you're doing and you know if it's the case adjust the planning and stuff like that anyway the message here is that you have to be very detailed and very careful when you're planning and then you have to use adaptive management you have to implement actions and then monitoring the success see if you're getting to your intermediate targets 
And don't wait, you know, to the final stage of your conservation plan to measure success. You need to actually be very careful about planning and monitoring. And that will help you a lot, I think. And then another lesson is that it's important to define adequate goals uh, according to the scale of the plan and accommodate expectations accordingly. So for example, in the case of SICADS, the targets and the goals that we have at the global level are very different from the targets and goals we have for the national level. And I think you need to think if you're working with just one species in a small region, or if you're working with a group of species in a huge country like Brazil, or if you're uh, working in, um, in, in different contexts, you have to adjust the targets. Of course, the final goal for everybody is to save species from extinction, but again, depending on the scenario, depending on the threats, and depending on what you need to do, what, what is feasible, you know, what may be more uh, impactful or not, you have to adjust your goals and your targets. For example, in the case of SICATS, at the global level for the last 20 years, we have been very successful at general things, for example, like keeping a species list updated and doing red list several times so we can, you know, and this has been really wonderful. This has allowed us to aggregate people, to get people from the academia, but also from the horticultural world and environmental authorities and other stakeholders engage. And then, for example, we have been very successful at networking at the global level, ex situ collections so they can collaborate. Now we are talking about meta collections uh, and stuff like that. For example, with SciCats, we were able to reply to an emergent global threat that arose about 15 years ago. We had a, um, an invasive uh, insect that pretty much destroyed and you know, drove to extinction one species in, in Guam, in one of the Pacific Islands. And we were able to share experiences and to mobilize at the international level to actually try to contain the spread of that invasive species and to help the people in Guam and other Pacific Islands to, to work on that. Anyway, so at the global level, it has been more about networking and, and getting the people together, getting the information, sharing experiences. But when we go and see the SICAT action plan at the national level, we also do national red lists, of course, to understand the situation of the species in the country, but we focus most, mostly on local actions like habitat protection and actually the propagation and reintroduction, restoration, and trying to establish sustainable use programs and stuff like that. Uh, and now we have, uh, because of the support of BGCI and other institutions, a global conservation consortium uh, for SICATS. And we kind of are, are, are linking these two levels, global and national. We also have SICAT conservation plans at the national level in South Africa, in Mexico, and one province in Australia. And you know, some other countries are working on that. And we are trying to get, for example, this, this figure of conservation champions in each country or in each region, we need to actually do more specific local conservation actions, but that's coordinated at the global level. Um, and then, you know, I will say this is from my personal experience. You know, I'm a biologist again, uh, working in conservation. And the first time I did a conservation plan, I mean, I was participating in the global conservation plan for SICATS, but the first time I actually, I uh, was like the champion or the leader for one, I didn't go like super big, you know, that might be overwhelming if you're gonna do for the first time a conservation plan. So one of my recommendations, it might not be effective everywhere in all the cases, but I think uh, one good thing would be to start small, a smaller scale uh, with a challenge that, that is not that overwhelming. And then, you know, build trust in yourself and your team and with the other stakeholders and build credibility. In the case of Colombia, for example, we did first a project in 2009, 2010, and we actually developed a conservation plan for one species, working with one environmental authority in one place, right? And we were able to get some uh, local um, communities involved and we were working with one botanical garden and we were able again to build trust, to build credibility, to get more visibility for the things that we were doing. And then we did another 
species and then we did a group of species in a region and then five years later we did a national plan for all the cycads which are about 25 in, um, in the country so i think you know you can if you're new to these i think one good recommendation would be to you know kind of build your way towards towards um expertise and in conservation planning and implementation also and then you know there's a very common uh challenge that people talk when we're talking about conservation planning in general but conservation planning for plants and is how to engage the proper stakeholders for the long term and also how to get funding. And my recommendation would be that we try to engage actors that can align their conservation targets with your targets, that is, look for synergies. In many cases, you can get a lot done without a lot of money. For example, if you look uh, for botanical gardens or local communities that want to propagate species because they're interested in, in producing timber or medicinal plants or other things. Uh, so for example, we have helped local communities uh, build um, community nurseries because they are interested in propagating plants and then we get our cycad species you know into their propagation plans or their propagation efforts and then you know we collaborate you know they want to do these nurseries and we want uh, to propagate cycads to so then reintroduce in the field so we work with them or for example um uh, in colombia there's a very big movement for private reserves and we're identifying key biodiversity areas and other effective area-based conservation measures. And there's a lot of people working on that already. For example, many KVAs have been declared because of bird species and mammals and amphibians, and they want to justify creating a new protected area or, or, or justify the man management of our existing protected area. And they're happy to learn, for example, that they have threatened plant species in their, in their territory. Uh, many of the protected areas don't even know that they may have threatened a species of plants uh, in, their, in their places. And we can work together. I mean, they're looking for resources. Maybe they already have resources for education activities or for restoration of habitats. So we can maybe collaborate with them uh, to get our species, you know, what they need in the framework of other conserva uh, uh, existing conservation efforts or work with botanical gardens, even with environmental authorities. You know, sometimes environmental authorities, they already have targets. For example, they need to protect 10% of the threatened species they have in their jurisdiction, and they have a little bit of money for that. So you can go and say, okay, you know, you, I have here five species that can help you get to your targets and I will work with you for that. So again, you can try to build synergies with them, maybe even use some of the resources they already have in order to advance your, your conservation targets. And then I will also say, you know, this sounds terrible, but, but I think it's, it's a good way to say, it. you have to sell your plans, you have to sell your groups. I mean, find and find charismatic stories uh, because you need stakeholders to get engaged and again for the long term. So there's a lot of cool things about plants that people don't know. And there is, I guarantee you, you can find a cool thing about your plants. We're very lucky with cycads because you know cycads are pretty, they're ornamental, but they're also living fossils, and you know, they remind people of dinosaurs because dinosaurs ate cycads, and you can, you know, get their attention very easily with that. And we have used that to do, you know, educational products and stuff. And do not underestimate the importance of these other conservation actions like communications and educations and engaging the stakeholders. And I'm sure you can find good stories. You know, your plant group might be important pollinators or they might be very important for because they're crop wild relatives or, you know, because of people use them but also because of ecological impact. I mean, there are many things and actually build stories, work with artists and communicators and other people to build stories and to build um, um, communication and educational products you can use to engage your stakeholders because once they're really interested in your plans, 
they want to help you. Um, um, most people will get fascinated with plants. They just don't know them well enough, which is, you know, Marzio was talking about plant blindness. You, we need to overcome that. And finally, um, more of a practical point, but I think this is also very important. And is not, you should not underestimate this. You need, I would say, at least one person that can dedicate enough time for guiding and monitoring implementation of the plan. Uh, all, most of us uh, have, you know, our volunteers for these uh, conservation plans, or, or they might be part of our job, but it's not our whole uh, job. So I would say it's very important to get a little bit of resources or maybe a um, um, collaboration with a conservation institution in which you can get one person to focus on this. So this would, in the case of Colombia, for example, we have a, we funded an NGO, a small NGO that is in charge of implementing the conservation action plan for the cycads of the country. And we have one person hired full time uh, and, that person you know, can do a lot of things and can engage the stakeholders and can go to the field anytime. And you know, they can do a lot of things to actually keep things going with all these volunteer people and you know, all these stakeholders we need to collaborate with. Uh, we have been very lucky because we have the support of Montgomery Botanical Center and other people that actually provide some funding to have one person. But even if you don't have money, try to get an agreement with an institution, but I think it's really, really important to have a person kind of uh, mobilizing everybody, you know, and getting things uh, done. Uh, because otherwise, if we, if you rely only on the volunteer uh, or, or, you know, like the time of people are volunteering, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. So with that, I will leave you, this is my email in case you wanna talk more about this. On, on, Okay, I will leave there. Thank you, Christina. It was another great presentation. I think we, we have overall <laughs> through the speakers really good examples of how things work. And um, Christina made a really good point that it didn't occur to me. We always, I always get overwhelmed with the number of species we have to deal with for plants. And it's like, we can't go species by species. But Christina made a really good point. When you're starting, it's good to start with one species and a small area and then progress from there to, to a multi-species assessment. And I think really important across the presentations, we saw how important it is to include local communities and, and other stakeholders that are not just scientists. That's the key, right? They are the ones living side by side with, with the species and having an impact on if they are protected or not. And yeah, Christina made a good point. We tend to forget about that as, as scientists and it's crucial. Conservation is not just a, a natural science. Uh, it's a social science and we need to start including more the, the social side of it. Um, okay, and with this, I just wanna remember people on YouTube, please join us on Zoom. We clearly have less participants than uh, the ones that registered and to go for breakout rooms, we'll have to stop the live streaming. Um, we didn't realize that, sorry, we're still learning. Um, so yeah, if you're on YouTube, please join us on Zoom. Kelly already shared the link there. And I'll open the floor for questions before we go to the breakout rooms. Are there any questions? I, no one posted anything on the chat, but feel free to raise your hand or put your questions on the chat. I'm also going to share, um, I just want to call out for the um, conservation planning specialist group, steps and principles. I think it's it's a great document um, and I'm gonna post the, the link to that there. They've also done a um, series of webinars over the summer specifically on that, that I'll put the link in the chat as well. Um, and they regularly have training for facilitators um, and they open it in their website. If you're interested, I would totally advise you to, to do the, that training. It's, it's online, usually it's free. Um, they also have in-person options, but those are paid. Um, yeah. 
Katya, a, a few people or oh, a couple of people, I think, um, sorry, I'm trying to see the names. Anyway, they were commenting on the importance of, you know, broadening our scope and trying to think about, you know, trying to think beyond just biology and natural sciences. And I'm wondering if there's anybody here in the audience that is, you know, from, I don't know, the social sciences or has more experience from the natural resource management sides or are we all here from the biology and natural sciences side of things? It's usually like that in the IUCN specialist groups, right? But maybe we have some other people. I mean, in some, like in, in, in the Colombian plant specialist group, we actually have people from environmental authorities that are part, but they are usually biologists, but they do work in the environmental authorities. But is there anybody here? that has more experience from like the social sciences, for example, or their types of... Probably not. Looks like not. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I think it's important to reach out, right? Yeah. Eduardo, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, I want I want to address one question to Christina. So Christina, great work, great presentation as usual. Uh, but I was wondering, after you conducted three cycles of species reassessment with your cycads, could you detect any genuine changes on the conservation status of these species? And another curiosity is how you were doing to address um, uh, uh, the pathway to fully ecological recovery, and if you had the chance to apply the green status of species, because this in Brazil still are challenges, as Mar as Marcio said, uh, we we reassess the conservation status of the Faveiro de Wilson, the Dimorphonia species, the study case uh, he shared with us, and what we found out is that we increased the number of uh, information, but we could not yet detect like a, a improvement on the species population. We just uh, uh, planted some seedlings in the field, and now we need to monitor that. And this is still a challenge. And the green status is still uh, data dependent for all species. And as you know, for Brazilian species, as, as well for Colombian species, we don't have many information. So sometimes it's difficult to do that. But with a small group such as the cycads, I was wondering if you could have more success with that. Yeah, thank you for, for the question, Eduardo. I, yeah, before I, I answer your question for cycads, I want to say that's another big challenge for us, right? We need to show success in our conservation strategies, and it's not easy to show, you know, like meaningful, like, like very qual quantitative success when we're doing conservation action for plants. And actually at the national level for the global biodiversity framework, one of the main indicators for a species would be the red list index, which is what Eduardo is talking about. And it's not easy to move species from one category to another category to actually show success. So yeah, that's a that's a huge point. And Domitila's here. Maybe Domitila can, can talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, in the case of cycads, most of the changes that we see from one red list assessment to another are not genuine. Mostly it, they change because we have more information, like what happened in Brazil and what happened in Kenya. In Kenya, you know, they were telling us, well, we went looking for the species and we found new populations. That's usually what happens uh, with most of us, I think. So actually the, the, the category might change to a better one, but it's not a genuine change. But in cycads, we do have a few genuine, genuine changes, mostly because cycads have been overexploited for the ornamental market illegally in like huge quantities in places like Mexico and Southern Africa for many years. And that situation has improved because of CITES and many of the efforts in the countries. So they're not, you know, we don't have now people, you know, like collecting thousands of individuals in the field uh, illegally. So yeah, some of our cycads actually have improved because of conservation actions, but mostly because of our exploitation related stuff. You know, in the case of habitat loss, yeah, we usually don't have genuine changes. I mean, positive changes in that in that um, in that scenario. But yeah, that's a very important point. You know how to how to show you're being successful in your conservation plan. It might not be that you change the category of the species, but you see can have a lot of success 
Uh, so you can show, we need to look for indicators beyond, I mean, red list index and green status are really important and awesome and we should do them. And they can show changes at the big level. The green status particularly can show the impacts of your conservation action. So I think that's very important. We're beginning to do that with Cycad. Uh, but yeah, we also need to look for other, let's say more precise indicators to show success in, in, in conservation action for plants. Thanks, Christina. And, and this is what happened with Favero de Wilson as well. We, 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 we did a lot of effort. There are a lot of people involved with the process. Uh, definitely, it worked It worked to do the conservation, but it's still a challenge to measure, to measure the, this, these uh, genuine changes and, and trends towards fully rec ecologically recovered. So let's try to do more green status and red list index. Thank you. Um, I, can, I can just add something quickly to that. <clears throat> and the red list index, the red list index is is well known for not being a very sensitive indicator, because it's really difficult to change a, a category. <clears throat> but you'll see that the new global biodiversity framework is asking us to improve the status of twenty percent of species by twenty thirty. Maybe they will negotiate to five or ten percent. The negotiations are still underway. But we have to show that we can improve the conservation status of 20% of our plants, which is going to be incredibly difficult. And when we have a red list index and we improve the status of 0.03% of our plants in a mega diverse country um, through our conservation action. So we have a long way to go. So just, but I think the thing is to to be aware that, um, you know, that, that, that the species that you work on, it is possible to choose single site endemics or you know, really restricted species and if you do protect them and change that you can show a change in status um, and then the other thing is to try to you know we, we maybe we need to collectively bring this up in the IUCN that we need a more sensitive indicator and so one of the things that's being suggested is that we can try to change the so so I find the red list categories themselves the way you do an assessment it it leans towards making something threatened so you can have, you know, 80% of the population getting better, but if there's still decline happening somewhere, it still comes out as a threat status. So that's, that is the problem. So I think that we may really need to look at that internally with the scientists who work in the, um, the Red List um, Technical Working Group and maybe the Red List Committee to, to see if we can't actually change that. And the only suggestion that's been made is that you can start to reflect to species when the population status um, option is stable because you know you have to say the population trend is it declining is it stable is it increasing so from when you can stabilize it that could be an indication that it's getting better it might not yet have increased but it's not going down like it was so those are the only suggestions so far but i agree it's a big problem actually that we can't really reflect it and we're being asked to show a reflection of 20 percent so <laughs> it's a it's a serious challenge and i think the green status is very difficult to achieve it's very complicated, very demanding. And uh, we have gone for a much more simple approach in our country of just protection level. Do Are we protecting enough of a population to persist into the long term? And that's all we're asking, <laughs> not like, have we recovered it to its former state, um, state and all of those things? Because the green state has asked a million questions and really technically complicated. That's my opinion, thanks. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, I can see a number of, of hands raised. Um, just to say, uh, Pranti Yardi shared in the chat with me who are the stakeholders included in the Kenya case study. So I don't know if um, Herbert and Yvette, maybe you can put that in the chat. Um, and then David was commenting, then we need to improve data collection and data quality. Um, yeah, I don't know if any of the speakers want to comment or, on that. I'd say it's, Ideally, yes, but in mega diverse countries like Colombia, Brazil, uh, and others with so many plant species, it's it's hard to access all the yeah the data we need, right? Don't know if anyone wants to make a specific comment on that. 
No, and I'll pass to Dan. I, I just, I just want to say, I mean, of course, we always want more information, but as Katya is saying, it's challenging. But I will say again, look for synergies. I mean, there might be other efforts in the country or, or your region already trying to get better biodiversity information. So try to collaborate and, you know, try to improve access. I don't know, like, like try to, to do as much as you can with little resources. Uh, there's a lot of people interested in getting more information about plants. We just need to, you know, look for those opportunities. And citizen science as well. I think that's, Absolutely. yeah, a good way for us to, to go um, and get people more interested in plants. Um, Again, I think the, the Procuris, the um, searching for project in Brazil, I think it's a great example to involve local communities. Okay, I'm looking at time and I can see we have a, a number of, of hands raised. Sheila, do you wanna go first? Um, hi, yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much um, for that talk, Christina. Uh, I'm from the Philippines and I just have this question. I was so inspired by your talk. Um, in, uh, in our country, trees are really rampant with, you know, when it comes to cycads, to orchids and everything. And it's really gone up during the pandemic because people lost their jobs and that's one way we can earn money. What really confuses that we are all advocating to encourage people to plant native plants, right? So, but then the thing is they acquired these native plants illegally because they are poached. So I don't know what would be the best conservation um, strategy for that. And um, this, you mentioned about your uh, cycads program you created like a community nursery. I'm curious came to be, what were the steps that you did to make it successful? And uh, was it, was the community nursery uh, instrumental in preventing poaching to happen? Or, I mean, how can I apply that in our situation here? Right, Sheila, thank you for your question. And I'm sure people, the people from Brazil and Kenya can also share experiences with trees and, and other uh, species that might be poached. Uh, cycads, yeah, cycads have very huge problems with poaching. And we have had experiences with community nurseries, mostly in China and Mexico, uh, a little bit in other countries. And they have had mixed results, I'm going to say. Uh, Mexico has been doing this for 20 years or more. Uh, and their logic was, uh, and this, this is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of discussion in this issue, but the idea is if you can get um, the mark, you can flood the market with the legal market with enough plants that are produced legally in a nursery and hopefully community nursery. So you can have actually uh, an economic incentive for the local communities to protect the species and the habitat, then you will reduce the, the illegal poaching because you know the people from the horticulture and, and plant enthusiasts they will buy legal plants and you know they will be happy and, and then you won't threaten the threat the, the natural populations. Again, mixed results in some cases has worked. In some cases it has been really difficult to actually get the permits and everything you need to eventually sell the plants legally. So there's a lot of things. In our case, we were doing community nurseries, but not for selling plants. They were exclusively for reintroductions, for conservation purposes. So we, we are not getting into the horticultural market and stuff like that, but we have considered that. And again, maybe in Brazil and, and Kenya, they have examples with timber trees or how to reduce, I mean, this whole premise of produce legal plants so you can reduce the illegal poaching Sounds really sen I mean, sensible and, and interesting, but I think it's difficult to achieve. Um, obviously, this is also uh, implemented in conjunction with like uh, regulating poaching and trying to, you know, like get to illegal collecting from a more punitive approach. But it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. I don't know if 
Herbert or, or Mancio or, or Yvette Eduardo have experiences in their countries. Thank you. Um, just to say the illegal trade is a huge issue and we're having parallel discussions within the SSC plant groups about that. And that's a great example where definitely we have to include social sciences um, because yeah, it, it's so complex and involves so many variables um, from people that depend on, on that. People depend on, on that trade to survive and that's how they feed their families. It's, it's really complex. Um, okay, I'll pass to Nigel. Okay, so so my point was following up on Domatillas, and that is about this this business of a twenty percent um, improvement in conservation status. And I was thinking, for, for us to, uh, working on crop wild relatives, it would be relatively easy to show this, because at the moment we have almost ninety nine percent of crop wild relative species are conserved in gene banks and virtually none, uh, maybe four or five protected areas around the world where they're being actively conserved in situ. So our main focus at the moment is on encouraging more in situ. And I would guess in the next few years, we'll have probably a 50% increase in genetic diversity conservation of crop wild relatives, simply by adding new protected areas that are actively monitoring crop wild relative species within those places. And if, if you include passive conservation as well as active, then just noting that crop wild relatives are present in a, in a protected area, if you regard that as conservation in itself, then we could go up to uh, as many as 100%. Uh, but if, you, if you're talking specifically about changing um, in threat status, then I agree that is obviously much, much more difficult. But that's threat status. That's not the same as, as conservation assessment. So conservation assessment is actually actively doing in situ or ex situ conservation. Uh, so I think I think we do need to make the distinction there. But maybe maybe this kind of interpretation, uh, other other groups would uh, benefit from that as well. Thank you, Nigel. Does anyone want to make any comment? Tilla put in the chat that sadly the red list status needs to change, I think, yeah. <laughs> they love you. <laughs> not, not an easy task. Um, uh, yeah, the wording is reducing extinction risk. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll pass to Jean. Thanks, Katya. I wanted to uh, talk to some points that, that both yourself and Christina brought up about branching natural and, and social sciences. Um, and that's just something that I'm involved in the Global Conservation Consortia. Um, so I think uh, we're these taxonomic focused groups um, that are taking species through the assess, plan and act um, stages. Um, to really focus in on these highly threatened groups. And so um, I'm the coordinator of the Global Conservation Consortium for Magnolia. Um, so this is a group that's been fully assessed. Uh, we know that more than half of them are threatened, um, a lot of data deficient. Um, and so I think uh, we're really posed in terms of Magnolias to be able to start um, making action plans for groups of species at the national level, um, regional level. Um, certainly, Colombia is primed and ready to go. There's been a lot of discussion. Um, and I can see opportunities in, in Mexico, um, in Asia, and other uh, really biodiverse places. So it's it's something that we're moving towards um, now that we have these, these lists of threatened species, um, these priority lists. and so. I was really excited to see this um, the assess to plan mat matrix because I think that will is something that will be super useful for us in grouping these magnolias together um, in terms of their threats. Um, and so I'm excited to be moving forward um, with that and and hope I can engage more with the conservation planning specialist group. And um, I did take the facilitators course, but I need a, a refresher as we move forward into having these kinds of workshops. So I'm excited to hear about all the successes that have come out of um, Africa and 
in Colombia and, and other places. So um, yeah, just wanted to, to say that. And yeah, if anyone here is doing Magnolia work, let me know. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. That's that's great. Um, and feel free to reach out to me. I, I won't. I don't know how much capacity I'll have to do the plan. I don't think that's something I could do. But definitely, my role is to connect the different groups. So I'd love to connect you with the conservation planning specialist group. Um, and I'm sure you're already part of the global tree specialist group. And just see how we can get some. Um, funding and resources together to, to move forward with that. So yeah, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, okay, I'm looking at time. We had initially thought about having a breakout room to discuss uh, singularities, singularities, challenges and opportunities, but we didn't realize that um, after live streaming, we lost the option for a breakout room or something like that. So I think we'll just have a continue with the general discussion for the, the rest of our 20 minutes. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any more questions or you would like to comment on those three uh, questions, let's say. I'm going to put them in the, in the chat. And we would love to hear experiences from, from the people attending as well. I had a, a question, I guess, from uh, in terms of the, the very initial stages that Yvette was talking about in um, getting those briefing documents, um, like where are we, how did we get to the stage? Um, was that something that you put together just remote, like remotely through email with people or did, uh, or do you think, uh, or was that in person? And do you think that an in-person session to do that would be useful? Good question, Jean. So we did, for Kenya, that was all. So we did, we sent out and circulated some briefing materials just of like the kind of the assessment context as well. So like um, that process of doing the matrices and like how we got to that bit we sent out beforehand. Um, but because it was all virtual the kind of where we are now where we want to get to that was all in a virtual session um but only because of COVID. but literally just two weeks ago we did a conservation planning um workshop for gardens threatened trees and that was in person so we did all of that kind of visioning this is where we are at the moment where we want to get to that we all did in the in person like the first day was kind of that context of um the kind of what we're striving towards um, and helps kind of develop those success indicators. We did all of that in person. And uh, yeah, I think it worked, to be fair, I think it worked really well in both, in both ways. Um, and yet very happy to like catch up later and share some of those resources that we've developed um, for that work or just more generally as well, because I think it's, you know, useful to have templates that people can use because yeah, everything's always a learning process and very happy to share this. Great, that, that, that would be great, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Yvette. Um, I can see Andre Carapetto has a, a question. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, uh, my question is, um, how difficult is to pass from the having uh, the species accessed uh, to planning the conservation action and uh, putting the conservation actions in the in place. Uh, my example, uh, I'm from Portugal. We just recently did our uh, plant red list. We were one of the few European countries that we didn't have a uh, plant red list. But we are feared this in the, in the beginning is the, and it, it happened. It's that we made the red list and now there is nothing is happening. OK, so my um, question is, can you uh, give me some uh, examples, ideas, how, how to put, uh, how to pass from the, the assessment of the extinction risk to conservation actions? And, and how can we um, motivate our local authorities to uh, 
have this plant conservation as a priority because it's clear that they don't have this as a priority. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Anyone wants to comment? I may comment how Brazil does a bit, but uh, the, 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 the key step I think was to incorporate in the Brazilian uh, official policy the need to protect the species. So after a lot of uh, political negotiation within uh, the ministry and all the, the stakeholders who took part on the, the uh, nature protection in Brazil, we align our uh, uh, national strategy of conservation with the global objectives of the uh, Convention of the Biological Diversity. So uh, by law, after we list the species, we need to develop an, an action plan soon. Of course, this is dependent on sourcing uh, uh, funds and, and uh, organize uh, all the, um, the workforce for that. So different stakeholders from different society, so, uh, different society sectors need to be involved as well. But it's a challenge, and definitely true. Uh, and we see this happening a lot everywhere. Like people are listing the, their species. I, I just had an experience in Ecuador. So Ecuador uh, did a, a red list book a, a couple of years ago. I think they have two editions of that, but the government is still not uh, uh, adapt, uh, using the results of that to guide uh, conservation planning and action, you know. And they have a strong group of specialists. Ecuador, uh, Ecuadorian uh, researchers are involved with several red list uh, authority groups and working for a red listing um, uh, uh, with IUCN as well, but nationally they still find challenging to, to, to have the government recognizing their effort, you know, and this is something you need to mobilize people and, and work with the conservation arena um, uh, policy and policy makers to convince the government that this is important and then with this uh, tag from the government saying that we, we must do that, I mean, by law, uh, I think this facilitates the work a lot, but it's one of the biggest challenges, I think, to translate red listing in action, actually, you know, so. Yeah, but okay. Andrea, maybe I, I cannot, I cannot, from the experience, for example, in South Africa and, and other countries, I think <laughs> the global tree assessment, maybe Yvette can talk a little bit about, about that, and magnolias and cacti, one next step that might be useful is to do a gap analysis. So you already have your red list assessments and then you can try to, and Nigel was talking also about it, how many of those are already in protected areas? How many of those are already in ex situ collections? How many of those actually need more direct conservation action? Because you're not gonna be able to do conservation action plans for all of them, even in Portugal. Uh, I mean, I, I'm saying this because you have probably less species than we do. But anyway, like for example, in South Africa, and we're trying to follow that model also, we don't want conservation action plans for all the species. I mean, maybe most of the species were in most in, of our mega diverse countries, the main threat is habitat loss. So if you can ensure many of the species are threatened are in protected areas, uh, that is you can feed the, the planning for the, the spatial planning for the conservation areas system in your country, then you're already doing a lot. And then you will have a few other groups, maybe the ones that are overexploited or have very specific threats by invasive species or contamination, then you know, it might not be enough to get them in, into a protected area. You need to do more specific actions. But I think that's another important point. We cannot do conservation plans for all the plants. It's impossible. It's 400,000 plants in, in, on earth. We will not be able to do planning for all of them. So we need to be a strategic, but maybe again, if you can link up with a protected area system of your country and do gap analysis and the C2 also gap analysis for C2, I think you can advance a lot and show the authorities, you know, like you need to focus on these plants in your protected areas. And, you know, maybe that's a step, next step that is a little bit easier than going directly into developing plans and action, but yeah, maybe um, again, we can share experiences from the GTA on um, South Africa. Yeah. Just to Thank say you. that, unfortunately, protected areas in Portugal aren't the best way to protect species. Oh, we okay. have only <laughs> one national park. Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. 
and we have we we have huge problems with fires as well. So a few years ago, even our national park, big chunk of it just burned, and um, it was quite catastrophic. So I'm not sure. Um, but I don't know, Andre, if you missed Yvette's presentation. I think Yvette really showed a good example how to move from the red list to the planning. And you, I think using the assess to plan is a great way to find priorities. And you look at threats, you look at what already is in place, the threatened species, and you try to prioritize how to, to move forward. Yeah. And I think it's really critical to include the, the right authorities from the start, so include local authorities include the um, ICNF and all that from the beginning. So from the, the, the first stages, make sure they feel ownership to, to the work that you're doing. And I think that's, that's key. And feel, feel free again to reach out to me if you wanna know more or connect with the conservation planning specialist group, I'm, I'm happy to help. Um, yeah, especially being Portuguese as well, it, it feels in my heart. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Tila. Yeah, I just want to um, respond with one thing around the, the <clears throat> what to do about the actions for, for the majority of species that are threatened by habitat loss. So I'll share my screen very quickly. Can I share? Yeah, you should be able to. Okay, I'm just, yeah, so you, sh hold on. Uh, so the, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the chair of the Plant Conservation Committee and I'm from South Africa. So um, um, <clears throat> uh, we, do, we have a lot of threatened species. And I just want to show one slide, which is we have this, um, we've taken all our species that are threatened by habitat loss and we've done, here's just one plant example, and we've produced, like, taken what we know of the, the points where we know them and we've done models of their suitable habitat. And then we've put it into a legislative legislative tool to for the environmental authorization process. So for every EIA that happens, <clears throat> the developer has to load the footprint online by law, and then it intersects with all the layers for every species. So it like checks which species are there, and then it gives a report on like okay these species are there. Now that also it's to tell them to do the EIA properly. The specialist must check it. They must say that they won't affect those populations of those threatened species, but it also for all the all the authorities to double check that they don't approve legis uh, development where they shouldn't. So it's just really to think about. You must have action plans for species threatened by utilization, by like like um, maybe what else can you say medicinal harvesting or anything of those sort of things. You should have action plans for those but for habitat loss where the majority of the species are you must think of you must think of expanding protected areas and you must make sure that your land use decision making is protecting those species so there must be legislation to protect the land use decision making process um, and that that for us captures most of the species so i'm very curious to see how brazil works having to do thousands of action plans when most of the threat is probably habitat loss um, we only have to do management plans for species that are are under risk from illegal harvesting and illegal trade, and and for and even you know legal trade. Those are the ones we do the management plans for. Thanks. Thank you, Tila. That's great. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. Sagar wanted to make a question as well. Uh, hi, this is Sagar Datir. I'm from Nauraji Godres Center for Plant Research, which is located in India. I work on ex situ conservation of plant species from the Western Ghats. So I have a question. Um, for example, I have a plant species and which is vulnerable. And if only a few plant species uh, or only a few plants are remaining for that particular species, how would we plan a conservation strategy for them? Anyone wants to comment on that? So maybe somebody who's got experience with bulking up the population and reintroducing, essentially, right? Who would be best placed to talk about that? 
Marcio's presentation had that. I don't know. I might be able to, to help, but I, I, I missed the question. Me too. <laughs> so, so the question was that how to do a conservation plan when there's very few individuals, right? Left exactly. of the species. Yes. Yeah. Marcio, want to comment on that based on the, the, the Favero de Wilson? Well, I, I will try to do a combo. Well, that's the, uh, the, the, the very uh, specific case Marcel just shared. And, and the first thing is to detect all plant species in the field and know the, the, the extent of the population. And after that, you really need to try to find ways to improve that. So uh, 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 bring the, the plant for nurseries, reproducing them, uh, 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 diversifying it genetically then you might increase your chances to reintroduce these uh, seasons in the field and, 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 and gain population again. Uh, but you also need to protect the habitat of the species. You, it's a huge challenge to recover uh, really small populations as uh, um, um, Cristina was saying about the cycads. So they have really, really small populations. And uh, uh, to bring them back, you need to, you need a lot of effort. So they are working for more over thirty years to recover these these plants. But you need to combine these strategies, you know, habitat protection and uh, reproduction of the species with genetically diverse individuals as mu as much as possible, I would say, and then try to bring uh, 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 this uh, um, cohort of individual new indiv newborn individuals to the field and monitor the, the developing of that as well then you might have a chance to recover your population. But it, it, it's a challenge, Sagar. I'm not so sure if I could answer your question properly, but I think the study case of Marshall shows that. So uh, initially, we had 200 uh, uh, trees detected, the only 200 trees that are mature individuals of Favero de Wilson. And after a lot of field effort, uh, uh, the, this effort revealed over two, uh, more 200 uh, specimens. And based on collections of uh, seeds from these, uh, uh, from several of these individuals, uh, they started to reproduce the species um, in nurseries. And now uh, they have the first cohort of, of individuals being uh, brought back to the, the field. And now we need to see if these individuals will uh, uh, hold the, the reintroduction, if they will uh, keep growing, keep developing. And we need to try to check for dieback rates if this is happening and what are our chances of success with this reintroduction. But uh, it's still something that we are doing very, uh, 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 for, uh, in a very small scale in Brazil so far. Okay, thank you very much. I think I got the answer. Thanks. Thank you, Eduardo. Marcia, I, see, I saw you had your hand up. Do you want to add anything? <laughs> Eduardo talked very well, but um, I can complement this. For example, this Favero de Wilson, uh, when we start to work with these species, and we have only uh, 200 uh, trees. And after this work with community, uh, looking for the trees on the nature, and today we have 400 uh, trees. And these trees are monitored in the nature, but uh, don't have the conservation areas uh, to protect the protect areas to to these species. Uh, these species, uh, Faviru, uh, live in in a farm place in farm areas, and then we our collaborators have a close um, are close to farmers to protect these species and monitor it uh, everywhere and a lot of time this, uh, like uh, 20 years, the research monitor these species in the nature, in the farms and, and have contact with the farmers to protect the, them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marcio. Um, okay, we reached our, our time, <laughs> let's say. Any, any final comments? 
if not, I want to thank everyone who who uh, participated, especially the, the speakers, of course, and I'll, I'll shout out to Kelly Greasy as well, the communication coordinator at the Global Center who helped me uh, um, lead this, this webinar. Um, we'll be sharing the recording later as well. And feel free, I'm going to put my contact, if you don't have it already, in the chat. So feel free to reach out to me, um, especially if you're a member of a specialist group uh, from the Species Survival Committee, um, Commission, sorry. And yeah, I'm happy to put you in contact with the relevant people. Thank you for the session. I hope it was inspiring and you want to do more conservation planning. Yeah, and we know it's overwhelming, but I think if we connect with the right people and learn from the ones who already went through it, it makes things easier. Um, and we're so yeah grateful that people are well willing to share their experiences. I think it's great. Okay, thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.